All right. We're here with Landon Groff. We're just going to jump in, too, like we usually do. All right. I'm excited, buddy. I've never really gotten an interview, so uh, I'll try to put the screws to you a little bit. All right. <laughs> we'll go back. Uh, it's just, you know, we I, I posted a little preview about you. Uh, you live in San Antonio, San Antonio area, right? Where, um, I live right west of Austin, Lake Travis. Where, where'd you grow up? San Antonio. Yeah? Yeah. So you were injured at 19, right? Yeah, 2003. I was 19, almost 20. <clears throat> what, was, what was that transition like? Because that's right in the, in, you know, like right out of high school, going into college. What? what yeah, was it was the end of my sophomore year of college and just in a hurry to get home and overtired and fell asleep at the wheel. And you're that young, unstoppable age. And uh, yeah. Then you wake up in a hospital bed and you're like, what the heck happened? And, you know, the rest is history. You decide still have a lot of life to live and figure out how to do all the things that you love to do before and realize that it's OK. But, like like what, what were some of those things? I know for me, it was hunting and fishing. Usually everybody on here is kind of the same thing. I, know, I mean, hunting and fishing, definitely. And then you're like, you know, how are you going to drive? You know, most of us, before you have a spinal cord injury, you don't have any idea what life looks like. You, you thought you saw someone in a wheelchair and all they can, can't do is walk. You don't realize everything that goes along with it. So, you know, basically putting your life on reset, having to, you know, learn this this new way of life. And, you know, for me, those first couple of months of inpatient rehab, it was tough just because you start going through the motions and, Back then, they'd keep you an inpatient a lot longer. Now, a lot of places you go phase one, phase two, come back when you've been home for a little while. But right. I was there for three and a half months. And it really, it wasn't until um, I went with a recreational therapist and she's like, you got to come see a rugby practice. And so I went and saw rugby practice. And um, at that point, you know, my prognosis was you're going to be able to dress the top half of your body and feed yourself. And that's, you know, not, not a very bright picture for a oh. 20 year old guy. No. And then so I went to this rugby practice, neck brace and all, and saw all these guys with similar function, less function, more function, doing things that I thought <clears throat> was virtually impossible. And at that point I was like, okay, well, I got this, you know, see it to believe it. I saw these guys, you know, transferring in and out of cars, um, you know, pumping up their tires and connecting compressors, stuff like that with, you know, minimal hand function like yeah. yours and mine. And so then I was basically from that point on, it's, okay, well, let's, let's figure out how to get there. And all starts with baby steps, you know, getting dressed, transferring with the sliding board, stuff like that. And then, you know, hunting and fishing was always a big part of my life. And you got to figure out, well, how the heck am I going to do that again? And yeah. then one day I, I came across some ancient website back when the internet was brand new, something called follow me outdoors had this quadriplegic in camo might be talking to him right now. And that was way back in the day, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, seeing how you had your orthotic device, you're able to shoot that was a, a big motivation for me to confidently start doing the things that i like to do and the rest is history i think i shot my first year maybe a year or two after i got hurt in west texas shot a mule deer and shot a bunch of bucks that first 10 15, nah, 10 12 years i got hurt but i actually i was thinking about it last night i don't think i've shot a buck in about eight years so, but now, now it's more, now it's more about, you know, getting friends down here. Um, never grew up this way. Didn't have the opportunity to hunt. I, I get excited when they get excited, you know. That, that first one is real important sometimes. Yeah. And it was for me anyway. Yeah. And when, you know, the big one walks out one day, I'll pop it. But <laughs> at, that, at that point, you know, I like, I think dove season is my favorite time of the year. You know, kicks off the season. Love to dove hunt, but 
I'm not that that angry at the deer. But we we come down here and do everything independently. Um, how how soon after your injury before you got into rugby? Uh, let's see. I think I got classified in 2006. So I went back to tech for about a year after I got hurt and, you know, just struggling with the beginning times of the injury. Oh, moved yeah. to San Antonio and uh, ended up finishing undergrad at UTSA and started playing rugby with the team there. And, you know, I'm competitive, so got to be a pretty decent rugby player. And at that point, moved to Austin and played for Coach Gumby in Texas Stampede and, you know, continued to progress and got invites for developmental teams, Team USA. And finally, what well, was it, 2013, I, it was off-season year, and I made Team USA, and that was a big deal. And uh, But, no, I mean, I, I credit a lot of my independence and everything early on to playing rugby, just, you know, being around guys like me that had that fire and drive to do all that. So. Yeah. It's hard. To, it's hard sometimes when you're competitive and you're in a chair you, to find an avenue to get it out. Yeah, no doubt about that. Be able to compete on either the playing field or anywhere. For for me, it was kind of like playing poker because that was yeah. that's, a, that's a real competitive game and where everybody's kind of equal and it's real easy for someone in a chair to play that. Yeah, you still get out to Vegas every once in a while, right? Yeah, we make it over there <laughs> once a year. Yeah, seems like rugby was a good. I know I know it helps out a lot of people, but it's a great avenue. If if you were gonna, if someone was out there interested in getting started, what would you tell them? How do they, how do they go about it? Um, pretty much any big metropolitan area in the country, there's gonna be a team close by. So just get out there and get to a practice, and you know you're you end up being around a bunch of quads and you know guys from all different walks of life but you're there for one reason you know to compete and have fun and you know if it wasn't for that and the injury you probably never know these are different groups yeah. of people that you come around but you know some of them been my best friends ever since so um it's it's a it's just a a good way and I, like i said i i owe my independence and my you know, well-being early on to playing rugby and being around guys like that. And now, you know, years later, I do a lot of that paying it forward, you know, in, in and out of the rehabs, just like you do up there at Tier, um, working with these newly injured people that can't see the light of day or what it looks like down the road. And, you know, everybody's focused on, you know, hey, I want to walk out of this hospital and, you know, you can go to YouTube and, Google any type of spinal cord injury and you can see something that people can latch on to. You know, they see somebody making a full recovery, but right, that, right. that isn't reality. Um, so in retrospect, the Internet's a, it's a good thing, but it, it can be a bad thing because a lot of people will just latch on to, you know, one of those perfect scenarios and, you know, waste their life or, or, or not waste their life, but they just they wait, you know that's it's their crutch well hey i don't have to do this because i'm going to get better um when in reality you know if, if you've been around people with spinal cord injuries none are the same but you just don't know that early on so it's it's easy to to lean on something positive when you know everything in your life before then has been ripped out from underneath you right. so um i and you know going into rehabs and working with patients now I'm probably just like you you know you don't want to ruin anybody's hope for making recovery or something oh, like that. Not. But, but you you don't at the same time you know you and i can look at them and tell them that we live you know happy fulfilling lives and you know whether they believe it at the time or not you know one day they're going to look back and be like okay that guy was right you know hey this isn't the end of the world you know yeah it sucks none of us wanted this to happen or you know and if, if we, we could fix us all, it'd be fine. But I mean, I can, I can look at a, a newly injured kid and tell him, Hey, 
somebody walked in this room with a magic pill that's going to fix one of us, I'm going to shove it down your throat. I won't even fight you for it because I'm, I'm happy in my skin and um, everything that I've done since then, you know? Yeah. So you've been through the trials. I mean, you're, yeah, we, we've handled it all. But then when you look at somebody helpless laying there in a hospital bed, you know, you have those flashback memories of everything hitting you at once, like drinking through a fire hose. For sure. I mean, yeah. so, sometimes you see yourself there a lot. I mean, no matter how long ago it was. No, I, I did my inpatient rehab at Warm Springs in San Antonio, and I still go in that hospital and it still looks the same and smells the same and just <laughs> brings back those memories. Yeah, fortunately, they changed tear up a little, bit, a little bit. They rebuilt a lot of it, so yeah. it doesn't look nearly the same. And and it was a long time ago for me, so they had to upgrade it. Yeah, thank goodness. So you went on the one, the, the another interesting topic about land is he, he went on and started a medical supply company called Maxwell Medical Services, right? How, how did that, what led up to that and how did that happen? So that all came about um, back in, gosh, two, probably around 2010, I would say. Um, again, started getting pretty good at rugby at that point and played on a team that we'd thrown together a couple of guys from Houston, uh, me and a friend of mine, Mark Zupan from Austin. We had an international player um, named Curtis Palmer from New Zealand. And uh, at that point, uh, one of the guys from Houston that was playing with us, his name's Jamie DuBose, and he had a DME company out of Houston called JNR Medical. And right. at that point, I'd finished college. I was in mutual fund sales and had my Series 7 license. And you just couldn't take off that kind of work to go train and compete and, you know, basically played an elite level. So I, I was blessed. I had the opportunity to go work with Jamie and I covered uh, territory in Austin and San Antonio. And, you know, most people that know me, you know, when you get to know me, you got to peel a, f a few layers back. I, I can be reserved, whatever. But, uh, you know, most people that have known me throughout my life would never think that I had a successful career in sales just because I'm not, I don't come across as that type of person, but you know, that's what I did. I, I wanted to play rugby at a high level. Um, I remember sitting there with my best friend, Travis asking me, I was like, you know, you think I can do this? And you know, the, it all made sense and added up and he's like, hell yeah, you can. So I started working with James and San Antonio and Austin and, you know, you're a, a guy in a chair and you're, you're competing against very aggressive salespeople. And, you know, I might've got kicked in the face and, you know, you get used to rejection going in and out of doctor's offices, trying to uh, build relationships and, and business. And, you know, I, I just kept at it. And, you know, before you knew it, I, I pick up a little here, there, go work in West Texas, you know, back where I went to undergrad at Texas Tech. And it was, you know, the people out there are a lot more friendly. So that built my confidence. And, uh, you know, eventually got pretty good coverage in San Antonio and Austin. And at one point I might've been the best sales rep in that area. My and, you know, worked for a couple of companies and, uh, both acquisitions happened and then, you know, towards the end started law school at St. Mary's and just decided I couldn't get out of this industry. So started Maxwell medical. Um, it's a funny story, you know, Travis, my best friend works with me and, uh, another friend of mine, Brian Shaner, you know, we were competitors and we didn't like each other very much, but I, I called him up one day and I was like, Hey, what do you think about us doing this? And, you know, he didn't have to think real hard. And, you know, it turned out after getting to know him better on a friendly side, we probably didn't like each other because we we're so much alike. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, anyways. So, yeah, I mean, that we kicked off right before COVID. And, you know, fortunately, we had longstanding relationships. Um, and again, Brian and I, Brian's a, a paraplegic and I'm a quad. So between him and I, we, we 
cover a lot of spinal cord patients in the state of Texas and do a lot of rehab work. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for our longstanding relationships, you know, having a new company, it, it had been challenging to get through COVID, but, you know, we, we muscled through it and things are good now. And, you know, we're ready to put the pedal to the metal and, and go from there. But, you know, again, it, at the end of the day, um, we enjoy working with our peers and, you know, they know that for the most part, we're the best people to, to take care of their supply needs because everybody's got our cell phone numbers. If they ever run to an issue, we're the ones to make the decisions. So right. um, it's, it's not like you're, you're calling a, a big corporation and, and getting the run around and passed around. You're always going to talk to a live face at our office. Um, we're always going to have employees in the office that are paralyzed that have been cathing for a long time. So that's, that's been a big advantage to the way that we do stuff is you can call Maxwell medical any day of the week and speak to somebody who actually uses catheters. And I mean, even more so than the people, uh, you know, the spinal cord injury, stuff like that, that Brian and I meet in the rehabs, you know, even, you know, some of the older guys that might be in a urology clinic and the doctor's like, Oh, you have to stick what, where, how many times a day? Well, next thing you know, you got a supply company calling them trying to ship them a catheter order. And, you know, in the past we we've had people who, you know, are just trying to get an order out. But when you've got a guy on the phone that says, Hey, I understand this, you know, I've been doing it, you know, yeah. they end up asking a lot of important questions. And, uh, by the end of the call, we're, we're probably shipping their order out and keeping them compliant with their health care rather than them clicking the phone saying, I ain't doing this, you know. So um, it, it's been a it's been a win win. We've got some good different implementations that uh, didn't necessarily have at uh, other companies I worked for. But for the most part, still the same. But we enjoy what we do. Um, you know, as Kathy, as you know, is not a fun thing to do and it can seem, you know, cumbersome and just a hassle, but really once you get the right product and you get it figured out and you get it down, it's the best way to take care of your bladder in our situation or, you know, anybody's situation that's in any kind of urinary retention. So um, we, we strive to get them there and, and I don't think anybody would have anything negative to say about the way we do business. Well, I love that, that y'all have the experience that you do like you said, with the cat and you've been through it all, you know, you know, so much that's out there, what's available, what works best and how to, you know, how to help people. You know, I, I like being able to call you up and say, okay, you know, what's going, can I try this? What, you know, yeah, I like to zero in on what's best for me. Like no doubt. Everybody, everybody should do. I mean, there's so many options out there. You really have to try stuff to find out what works best for you. Exactly. And once you get it figured out and you get your routine down, um, it, it's not that big of a deal. I, I tell people I can probably go to the restroom and cat, you know, not take much more time than somebody, you know, going to empty their bladder the old fashioned way. Sure. And I, you know what, I, I have different kind of cats for like emergency steak and different ones for travel sometimes than I do like my everyday run of the mill yeah cast so it's it's good you know you just don't stick with one thing all the time and no no well I, and i mean I, since i got hurt i mean we used to use plain jane catheters you put the lubricant on and now yeah. i mean hydrophilic catheters are the main you know main deal they get slicker than snot and there's not a whole lot of friction and they're it just takes one step out you know, as far as putting lubricant on the catheter, but those are the, ones, those are the ones I like to have for emergencies. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there's so many different products out there. Uh, you know, again, cathing's not fun, but we can figure out a way to, to make it not so bad. Well, I'm going to help, you know, I'm going to help promote you because I'm, I'm on board with what no, you're doing and, and I, I know you're helping I know you're going to help support able outdoors too. So hope, absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully we can, uh, hopefully we can carry it forward real far, go all the way together. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I've heard Al was talking about here. I'll put it up on the screen about how people used to boil them and reuse them. 
Oh yeah, the red rubber catheters. That's red, that was it. You know, Medicare Medicare would cover I think a couple catheters a month, and then at one point, you know, it got to you know where they would cover one per day, and you know everybody's they did their homework Medicare, and you know they'll provide up to two hundred catheters a month, and it you know it might seem crazy to some people that don't cath, but you know, they've done enough research that shows if you do a single use catheter um, and, and they pay for it, you know, it's going to keep people out of the hospital. And ultimately, you know, that extra cost that they're paying for catheters, they're making up for it by keeping people out of the hospital with constant and, infections. And the cats get cheaper when they make 50 million of them as to right, as right. And not as many. And just for instance, those red rubber catheters, a lot of people still use them. But I mean, they're made of rubber and latex, and the cost of making those now is insane compared to, you know, regular vinyl or PVC or yeah. plastic catheter. So, well, awesome, buddy. Well, the, the, the switch gears to the real reason that that we're doing this interview at Landon. Yeah. Landon has the South Texas Ranch that he has set up, fully accessible. So, you know, I. Ever since you were telling me about that, uh, I've been planning on coming down there and, and yeah. filming some of that stuff. So tell, tell me about your accessibility and uh, the things you've done to adapt to hunting on a ranch by yourself. Right. So um, my place is in South Texas between Eagle Pass and Laredo, um, deep South Texas. If it doesn't, you know, poke you or sting you, it bites you down here. You're way so, down there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a brush country. Um, I've hunted down here most all of my life and it, there's just a, a mystique about it. Most people would, would look at the country and they'd be like, why on earth would a deer want to live there? But down in this golden triangle area, you know, there's the Forbes here, you know, produce the monsters in Texas. Um, everyone outside of Texas who might be watching this, you know, yeah, our deer are smaller. Um, not, like the hill country deer, but I mean, we shoot a big deer down here. That's, you know, 150 pounds field dress. That's a big deer, but we've got big horns. And again, that's, that's, that's to do with all the black brush, wahia, um, just all the, all the protein that's out there for the deer to eat. Um, this has been a crazy year. There's been more rain down in South Texas this year than like the last 50 years. You got to have water to have deer. Um, I've got a couple of ponds down here that I run well water to um, because it's usually a, a very arid, hot place. Um, and like I said, you got to have water to have deer this year. Yeah, and I, keep, I think we had the mesquite beans. I think we had two crops this year. Um, the quail populations are insane. Um, it, it's just, it's about as lush as it ever gets in South Texas. But what I, what I did to kind of make this place work um, a good friend of mine, you know, he got into hunting uh, later in life, and he, he's a quad that I played rugby with for years. His name's Mike Schockerbauer. We come down here quite a bit. He's got a little more hand function than me. I always joke around. I, I'm a tall guy, so I've got the lap, and he's got the hands. So we can pretty much get anything done, um, and, and we've perfected it over the years. I, I've got several ground blinds that, you know, we have them on the ground up on cinder blocks just so the floors don't rot out. And we got ramps up to them, got windows that, that we can get down, um, stuff like that. So getting in a blind is not a problem. Um, I've got a, a interesting trailer blind that it's built on an old forklift boom. And so it can actually elevate us up in the air. Um, so it's a neat deal. I've got a couple of bow blinds. Uh, Mike's got hand function to shoot a bow and I'm, I'm working on that. But, uh, the big thing down here is, okay. So you got two guys in chairs. It's hotter than heck down here most of the year. And all your, all your able-bodied friends at that point, they're like, well, I'm not going down there with you. We're going to be slinging sacks of corn and breaking our backs, blah, blah, blah. So, um, that's just always a joke. Everybody wants to come down, uh, during the deer season, but when it's time to, to do all the like crickets but um so we kind of started i mean i've got stand and fill feeders and yes in texas we 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 put our corn out it's just how we do it you gotta you know, put corn out I, down there 
love it or hate it. That's what we do in Texas. But, uh, you know, so we've got these stand and fill feeders and they're probably about anywhere uh, five, six feet tall. So again, too high for two quads to really, you know, lug feet up and, and get in the top of the feeders. So they've got these blower systems and, you know, we kind of tried to mimic one with a, a steel blower and, you know, a 55 gallon barrel where we could have it on trailer and we could dump fac- sacks of feed into there and blow it up into the feeders. And so we did that for a little while. Um, cotton seed, big thing that we feed down here, you know, during the spring and summer, along with protein, cotton seeds, not, not too hard to deal with. We put them in baskets, but you know, we, we really got into feeding the protein at that point. It, it made sense, bit the bullet and bought a, a feed blower hopper. You know, we drive it seven miles down the road to the feed store and get bulk feed. And I pull it with the back of my truck and back it into a feed pen or a feeder. And it's got a big hose on it. And we get the lids off the feeder and get the hose up there and turn the, the motor on for the blower, you know, pull the gate of the hopper and the feed just, it blows right in there. So uh, you know, we've, got it, we've got it pretty, pretty well perfected to where two guys in chairs can get down here and do it. And I mean, I've, I've even been down here by myself um, several times doing it on my own. It takes a little bit longer, but you know, at the end of the day, when you're, you're as disabled as we are and you can come down here and do something like that, it's a, uh, it's rewarding. It's and, amazing, amazing what two quads can do together, isn't it? Oh yeah. I mean, we've, we've taken deer and um, we we're sitting in the blind this morning and I was telling my uncle, you know, it was on new year's Eve and, it was a cold morning and I wasn't that angry at him. And Mike went out in the blind and I woke up about eight thirty, eight forty-five, 45 and he wasn't back. And I was like, Oh, he must've shot something. And that was the first time that, you know, two quads, we, uh, we hauled and dressed a deer out on our own. Might've taken all day, but Hey, but now I've, I've got a Jeep with uh, a boom on the front of it and a winch to where, you know, we shoot something and lay it down in the Sendero. We go scoop it up quick and bring it back to camp and take care of it. So like I said, we've got it pretty well perfected. Um, here at the camp where I'm sitting, we've got a, a 20 foot and a 40 foot uh, shipping container that are built out in the inside. It, it's not roughing it like I've, I've done, you know, in the past, you know, you, you've got ramps up to them, got bunk beds, we've got toilets, water, heat and AC, stuff like that. But um, down here hunting as a kid everybody used travel trailers stuff like that well you know all sorts of bugs rats get in them and these uh these shipping containers are amazing i mean they're steel boxes so uh yeah it, it's pretty awesome you just lock them up ramp up to them and go uh i don't know that i would be able to to conveniently like host someone in a power chair. Yeah. Um, we'd, have to, we'd have to tweak some stuff around, but again, uh, if you, if you're a quad and you could transfer, um, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to do stuff for us down here. Well, I can't wait to get set up. If, if it's possible, we're going to come down there and film a, film a weekend where, where you're go- coming out as a quad and, and yeah. just fight and just filming that whole experience about, how you do everything out there solo or, or two quad, two quads and a deer we'll call it or something like that. No, anytime you tell me we'll, we'll get down here and do it. I'm pretty sure there's not much. You might have the only setup like that in the country. So we yeah, no, it's, it's no people. And it's, it goes back to, you know, you think about it early on. It's like, well, how the heck am I ever going to do that again? And then yeah. with enough, uh, feedback and just again i mean chad you're you're the first one that made me realize i could do this so um beyond that, it, buddy. Uh, no I, I my orthotic device we we made it way back when and i still use it to this day and it allows me to pull the trigger but no we've got it we've got it pretty pretty g'd out so to speak for um people in chairs to come down here i mean uh dove hunting hog hunting whatever it may be um we we get after it but you know it's always nice having the able bodies here but 
again, like I said, there's more often than not, it's a uh, few guys in chairs down here by ourselves doing it all. Well, we're going to, man, we're, we're hitting 1230, but I mean, we covered a lot of stuff, man. I appreciate you coming on and you bet. we're, we're definitely going to get on again. Cause I want to talk about some of the, some of the bigger hunts that you've been on and have planned to go on and, yep. and you know, our, our, I had landed down for our, our teal hunt that we filmed the show on that, that we're, we're going to come out with that maybe this week or this Sunday. So I'm going to, you're, you're coming back for that again next year. Cause we're going to ho hopefully we'll be, hopefully that's going to be an annual thing. Cause it, the footage is pretty amazing. No, yeah, and I mean, next, next season, we'll, if y'all want to, we'll come down early in the year when we can kind of track the bucks better and, you know, get a big boy on the ground. That'll be cool. We're, de we're definitely setting that up if it's possible, buddy. I appreciate yep. it, man. All right. Hey, I'm jealous, man. Go, you're going to be hunting this evening in deep South Texas, I'm, and tomorrow I'm jealous. Yeah, hopefully it'll be a little colder tomorrow. I think that front should hit down here. Uh, I can't wait to get down there. It's, it's time. So, man, once again, we're, we're going we're gonna to hit you up soon because great interview. Thanks for the support, and uh, we're going we're gonna, to hopefully we can give some back to Maxwell too. You bet, Chad. Lead some people to – Call Landon, he'll take care of everything. That's what I yep. did. I just yep. called you up and said and said, get me set up and you did. Yes, sir. We'll do it. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Good hunting. We'll see ya.